So the uh, great Kabbalists of Morocco tell us that there are three graves in this cemetery where the Shekhinah, the Divine Prince of, of God, hovers more intensely than anywhere else in Morocco. Those three Kvarim are number one, Rabbi Yehuda ben Atar, which is down there, we'll talk about in a minute. A man by the name of Rabbi Avner Hasir Fatim, who's buried there. And a very special lady by the name of Surika Hashwal, who's buried over there. Over there. So she was known as the Sadeket of Morocco, the most righteous lady that lived in Morocco. And there are countless stories of people that have come to this place, which you're privileged to be in greater Hakeva, and have seen Nisim Ben Iflot, incredible things happen that they needed in their life, just by praying at her, at her great son. And I think it's important we should point this out. You know what? Everybody needs something. Everybody needs something. And even if you think your life is great and blissful, you know what? There are other people that need your prayers as well. If you have the opportunity to be here, we're going to give people private time to pray. In a few minutes' time, you need to pray for the people that are well, for the soldiers that are kidnapped in Israel and should return home. It's quite a lot of them still missing in action. Protection of the state of Israel, protection of our soldiers. Everyone has something to pray for. Now, this woman did not live in Fez. She lived in Tangiers which is far north of Morocco, near the ports of, of, uh, of North, North Africa. And she came from a family that was full of Torah, full of mitzvah, but she was an exceedingly modest girl. And her father used to rephrase to her every day the concept of kol kevodah bad melech kenima. The idea that a Jewish woman's beauty is internal, it's not external. And she took that quite literally, although that's not so the way we do things, but she, therefore she didn't go out very much. She didn't like to be seen in public, but she was an exceptionally beautiful girl. And the story goes that one day, one of the wealthy Muslim neighbors, he saw this woman, he was struck by her beauty, and he decided that this was the woman that he was going to marry. The only problem is that as a Muslim, is not allowed to marry a Jew. So he came to the Khashwal family and promised them tremendous wealth, and he said, you know what, you won't suffer, we just need your daughter to convert to Islam. The family uh, was pressured, of course she doesn't want to convert. And every time the authorities are coming to the house, the father is saying, I don't know where she is, she's not home. She went into hiding because the pressure became so intense. And her mother was kidnapped by the authorities, about to be tortured. The pressure became so much for her, she understood what was going to happen. So she, she, um, she came out of hiding and she was taken in by the authorities. At that point, a rumor spread that she had already converted, which obviously was not true. And uh, now that she wanted to return to Judaism, that was a very heinous crime in the Muslim world. But she said, I'm not converting to, Jew to, to Islam, I'd rather die as a Jew. And she understood that if she would be in prison, she would be tortured to death. So first they tried to cajole her with money and wealth and jewelry, but she was steadfast in her conviction and her faith. So they summoned the rabbi of Fez was now in Fez, they summoned the rabbi of Fez, Rabbi Rafael Asifrati, who is the other rabbi buried here, to come and speak with her. And he said, it's better that you convert so that the Jews in Fez don't suffer because of you. And just to say the words, and this in itself is difficult for to understand, that there was a legitimate ruling of the Rambam. Just to say the words that Muhammad is the prophet is not considered blasphemous, it's not considered you're going against the Jewish law, and we will, maybe we have time we'll discuss that ruling of the Rambam and why he said it, and therefore it's not a problem. You can say it, and you can just, you know, go through the motions as if you're becoming a Muslim, but of course you're a Jew at heart. She said, I will not betray my God, even if it means I have to help other people. So the rabbi turns to her and he said, well, what about Queen Esther? Queen Esther married a non-Jewish king in order to save the entire Jewish world. She said, the difference between Queen Esther and me is nobody knew Queen Esther was Jewish. But everybody knows that I'm Jewish. So they told her, we're going to drag you through the Mela on a horse. Up here. And here's the most powerful part of the story. When a Jew is about to die, a woman like Sulika, who is modest, what was her final will and testament? She turned to one of the women near her and asked for a needle and thread. Why? She took that needle and thread and she stitched the end of her skirt into her legs. So that when she was dragged round the mela, her dress should not uncover her legs. 
she shouldn't be immodest and that men shouldn't gaze on her. And she was dragged around this mela and she died. But the story doesn't end there. Because the Muslims around here who were, who were out for more blood decided we're going to burn her body. So Rabbi Rafael Sefati bribed the officials to allow him to have access to what was going on. They came in with a few police and he scattered coins all over the floor, silver coins, in order that they should be distracted. And they were able to take the body back and bring it into the mela and they locked the doors in the mela and eventually she was buried. Things were not always good here in Morocco. But this lady taught us how it is to what it is and how it is one should die as a Jew. I also want to share you something that I saw a few weeks ago. And then we'll leave you with a message and we'll go and pray. In the 2006 war of Lebanon, one of the soldiers that was killed was Colonel Emmanuel Moreno. And his unit was sent to Lebanon to stop the flow of arms from Hezbollah from Syria and Iran. When they were sitting shiva for this man, a Chiloni Chayal, a non-religious soldier, came into the shiva house. And he told the family, I want to tell you a conversation I had with your father, your husband, a few weeks ago. So the two officers were sitting and discussing all possible eventualities that would happen in an imminent battle in Lebanon and how they would respond. So two weeks before, an IDF helicopter had killed five soldiers in it. And the officer turns to the family and he said, Emmanuel asked me the following question. What would you do, God forbid, if our helicopter is hit by a missile and you have only five seconds to live before that helicopter explodes? And I said to him, I don't know, I guess it'd be very sad. I'd wait for it to be over as quickly as possible and shut my eyes. He said, well, what would you do? He said, what would I do? He said, I would say Shema Yisrael. So he turned to his friend and he said, oh, big deal. You're going to say Shema Yisrael, but what, does, what good is it going to do anyways? The helicopter is going to explode in five seconds. So listen to what a Chayal said, a Chayal Kadosh. He said as follows. And this he turned to the family and he, said, he, told, he told them that what he said to me will stay with me for my entire life. That if a person has five seconds to live and believes that there's still a purpose to life and is driven by eternal consequences of the world to come, then it means that his life has meaning. But if a person has five seconds left to live and doesn't understand the importance of those last five seconds, then it appears that his entire life has had no meaning. Because we don't only live to fulfill our physical desires or just to have a good time, but rather life is one stage on the way to the next. I think Rav Noach Weinberg put it beautifully. He said that if you have nothing that you're willing to die for, then really you have nothing you're willing to live for either. The idea and the goal and the beauty of this concept of Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying God's name in the most sublime way by dying. Many survivors have said that, you know what? I heard from Rav Tauba, all those people that died, Al Kiddush Hashem. It was a challenge, but it only lasted a few minutes. The real challenge of every Jew, and when the message we're going to take from this woman today, to take how she died but to live that way. And as I said in Poland a few weeks ago when we were there with Svi, maybe the people say, well, how do you live a life of Kiddush Hashem? The idea that everything that you do and everything that you say and how you conduct yourself and how you speak and how you think, people should point to you and say, look at this Jew. i give you one example. Many of you are parents in schools. You have kids in schools. Most of your schools have security guards at the front. Many of those security guards are not Jewish. The ones in Hasmonea are not Jewish. How many of you, when you drop off your kids to school, if you see them, A, either say good morning, acknowledge them. I teach in Hasmonean girls, and I said this, you know, they're, they're looking after our schools. I bought, I bought them a few donuts a few weeks ago. Two Russian guards. And I handed them and she said to me, you know what, we've been in this school for seven years. Nobody's ever bought us anything. I said, no, I just wanted to buy you something for breakfast. I bought myself a donut. I said, it's a donut. 
small thing. Or you're standing in line in Tesco. I saw my own eyes on this. And you're on the phone. And you don't acknowledge the checkout woman. And she turns to me and she says, well, what is it with you people? You can't acknowledge someone who's working for you? Little things that we can change. The big things even more so, how to live as a Jew, you have to learn how to live as a Jew. That is the idea of Kiddush Hashem. The concept that we live with an understanding that there's someone looking over us and we need to make him proud. Like this woman over here made her pr him proud as well. Yizichah Baruch, may her memory be for a blessing. And all our tefillot today, all our prayers today should be answered with Tovah, with a positive response. To should pray heartfelt prayers for those that are not well, for those that need to get married, for those that need children, for those that need success and business. Amen. <laughs> Especially the story of the lion's den, which is why there is a lion on this kever. So, what is the story of the lion's den? So, this man, uh, Rabbi Yehuda ben Atar, lived at a time of the uh, the Melech that we've referred to a few times, the Mullah Ishmael, one of the most wicked kings that Morocco ever had. And this man, the Mullah Ishmael, used to uh, make sure that the Jews paid extremely high taxes on a regular basis. They used to arrest Jews for no, no known reason, demand ransoms. And the story is told that one Pesach, Cholomoyed Pesach, they came to the shul and they took Rabbi Huda ben Atar, chief rabbi of Fez, in chains to jail. And the king said that unless you uh, pay an extremely amount, high amount of money, um, he's got 24 hours to pay it, we're going to throw him into the lion's den. The only problem is that the taxes were collected before Pesach, the Jews had no money. What are they going to do? So 24 hours came and went, money wasn't paid. So uh, they went back home downtrodden, understanding that they really had no, uh, no remorse, there was nothing else they could do. So the next day the king ordered that Rebuda ben Atar should be thrown into the lion's den. This lion's den here in Fez, he made sure that the lions were not fed for three, hour, for three days. And they took this rabbi and they threw him into the center of this arena. The people that had done this looked down in aghast and in awe. Because the lions not only did not attack him and maul him, they seemed to circle him, number one, to protect him. And in one of the lions they ride was actually snuggling up his mane onto the rabbi's arms. This is very freaky, they said. This is something not normal. So they called the king to come and see what had happened. And the king was blown away. And he said the words, Ish Elohim Kadosh. That this man is a holy man. So he brought him out of the, of the, uh, the den. He fell in front of Rabbi Huda ben Atan. He begged for his forgiveness. And uh, Sfarim writes, That Meoto Yom Hukar Rabbi Huda ben Atar Afbe Eneha Muslimi. That from that day forth, even in the eyes of the Muslim world, he was very highly esteemed, ki ish Elohim Kadosh, like a holy Jewish, a holy man of God. And for the rest of his years, while he was here, he was able to avert many evil decrees because he had gained such high esteem and respect in the eyes of the king. So, you know, we all know the story of Daniel in the lion's den. 
This happened between the years of 1655 and 1733. I'm not sure of the exact year that it happened. But right here in Fez, the miracle of the Guvarayot of Rabbi Huda ben Atar, Zechutoya Genalenu. Time is short today. We have a lot to cover, so I'm going to keep it brief. I have more to say, but I'm going to pass on now to Sweet. Just one uh, last uh, added thing that I think we need to remind ourselves of. We are standing here now on his yard site, which is tomorrow, which is tonight. Okay, we have a great spot to be here on the yard site of Rabbi Huda ben Atar. This is where the pilgrimage, if you want to call it that, will take place tonight. And Jews from Morocco and from abroad will come towards uh, this area today and tomorrow uh, to be standing by his kever. You know, uh, it says uh, every year we speak about the concept uh, when we stand on Yamim Noraim of uh, during Barosh uh, Hashanah Tikatevun. Okay, just before that, of course, we say the very famous prayer of Unatana Tokev. And it talks about the concept of that where everyone passes, pass, uh, passes by a Kodesh Barko and they're judged on that day. And they ask the idea, what, who's judge? Everybody? Even the Meitim? Even the people who have died? And the answer by Chazal is yes, even them are judged on that day. How can they be judged? How is it possible that we can judge somebody who's dead? It's Bishchut, the people who are living here on this world. What we do in their memory, what we do in their lives, what we do, excuse me, in our lives, in memory of these people. What we do Bishchutam, that's in what they're judged. You know, when we talk about a Pashut man many times when we're in the, like a, a cemetery like this, okay, I'm so far my guys, we might, if we have time, we'll sort of say, yeah, like, go find us somebody who has a yard site today. Why? Because what are you effectively are you doing to that person if you go and down, stand at his kever on the day of the yard site? You're pushing him from economy class into first class on my net. No. Okay, from economy class into first class. That's what you're doing. You're making him sit by the kavod. We know that Rabbi Yudha Banatah is sitting by the kisei kavod. And so now when we stand by his grave today and we're able to pray here at his grave, pretty certain that he's going to be able to take our tefillot to the right place. We stand here, as I said, on the air of his yard site. So maybe uh, now as we stand here, we spoke about the concept that we have to utilize every possible way to be able to turn over decrees which are gazalin, nixalin, or I should say, have been decreed against Amisar. Um, the Yagen Aleinu, as we say, in his merit, we should be protected. Okay, that we should uh, hopefully as well, uh, he should be able to turn over any decree, be able to explain to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, look what's happening down there on the earth. Okay, they've come to my kever on this day in order to be able to pray to you, Hashem. Let's see what we can do for Amisar.